Welcome to Sierra Club Chronicles. The Exxon Valdez oil spill is the worst man-made disaster in our nation's history. Sixteen years later, the hard-working people of Cordova, Alaska are still struggling to get their town and their lives back in order. says the leak has now slowed to a trickle, but the amount of oil spilled is like nothing seen before in Alaskan water. I'll tell you, you know, when the, uh, oil hit the water. <clears throat> uh, it was a tough time in this town, definitely. <laughs> and uh, people didn't know what to do. You know, we talked to... We talked to like seven different lawyers and we get seven different... You know, really, I, I mean, it just makes me mad and I didn't realize, you know. How much it still makes me mad, you know. Uh, and it's like, oh my God, what did we do? It was pretty stressful, definitely. It's really hard for the world to understand what we had and what we don't have now. When it happened, our worst fears were realized. I mean, my business was ruined by, by Exxon, basically. We're so dependent on that water. It gives us life. It, uh, it, just, it just brings us life. It keeps us alive. And, and when the oil covered the water, it died. You got 30,000 people in the spill zone that have yet to be compensated for the nation's worst oil catastrophe, which is man-made. It's not like in New Orleans where, you know, it was a hurricane or it was a natural disaster and all of a sudden there's billions of dollars to compensate those people and help restore their lives and get it back to normal. Here, Exxon was the reason our way of life was changed. One of the most horrifying things about the Exxon Valdez is there was a tragedy caused by the actual spill. But there has now been 16 years of callousness in refusing to bring the tragedy to an end. The Exxon Valdez is not over. It is still going on for the people of Prince William Sound. And Exxon seems determined to keep the story going as long as possible and to keep this tragedy alive. You, you, you have had some good luck and you don't realize it. You have Exxon and we do business straight. If your nets don't fill up, that we can take care of. If you can show that your motel knows out of business, that we can take care of. We will consider whatever it takes to keep you whole. Cordova before the spill was a paradise that, uh, you know, we just hope not too many people came and found out about. <laughs> but going out on the water was a spiritual experience. You went out with your family. My kids were pretty much raised on the boat in the summertime. I mean, it was a family operation. I remember my mom and dad both fished in the summers, and just the hustle and bustle of the town was just incredible. I mean, there was couple hundred more boats fishing and so the fishing aspect of town just every spring it was just everyone running around there's so much like energy and excitement when we were trying to get our permit together uh, he was i don't know four years old or something we were sitting up in our cabin we had a little cabin in the interior that we used to winter in and uh, <laughs> 
he's sound asleep in the, in the bed, and all of a sudden he sits up and says, it must have been about four, and he says, my daddy's a wisherman. When I grow up, I'm going to be a wisherman, too. <laughs> and fell right back over to sleep. What boat is that there? Is that the... This is on my same boat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's giving mouth to fish resuscitation or something. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't keep him out of the fish. You know, fishing was good then. We had a whole deck load there, and and uh, the kids loved it. It was great. It's a great way to spend time with anybody. A really screwed way to spend time with your family. Clean air, hard work, beautiful surroundings. I started fishing with my father when I was seven years old, and pretty much all of the kids, there were seven little Indians in our family, we all grew up on the ocean. So we grew up, you know, living from the bounty of the ocean, and, and the beauty of this place, you know, was just stunning. Our way of life is tied directly to the ecosystem and the pristine quality of the environment. I knew that, you know, someday, I would be able to pass on this heritage and this fishing culture to my little papooses when I had them. And before that happened, though, the Exxon Valley's oil spill happened. The terminus of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, which carries the oil from the Arctic, is in the port of Valdez. And in order to get the oil from Valdez to the United States, you have to take it down through Prince William Sound. And that was one of the big concerns about developing the oil in the first place. We knew Prince William Sound was sensitive and vulnerable, and we knew that it was a very dangerous place to take oil tankers. My grandmother, Ataki, who was full-blooded Eyak, she told me that development and progress was going to change our way of life and our relationship to the ocean and the land. She said, it's only a matter of time. If, if they're finding oil, then that's going to change everything. And a lot of what Grandma told us came true. We knew that it was inevitable that an oil spill would happen, and we also knew that there was no way we could ever clean it up. Good evening. The unthinkable has happened in the pristine waters of Prince William Sound. Shortly after midnight, the tanker Exxon Valdez ran aground 25 miles south of the city of Valdez. It is the largest spill of North Slope oil in history. There was this loud banging on my door, and I thought it was some family emergency or something. I go rush into the door, and it's, it's Jack Lamb, the acting president of Cordova District Fishermen United. And Jack says, all he said was, we've had the big one. And I just remember looking to his eyes, and I knew what he was talking about. So the fishermen deployed me to fly over the spill and report back. We just kept circling, circling. You could just see the slick was moving like an amoeba. It would stretch one way, then it would stretch another way. Exxon had no sort of plan B if anything happened. I mean, it was blind leading the blind. Exxon's attitude was one, first of all, of disbelief, I guess. There were three or four days of perfectly flat, calm weather, and Exxon was just doing nothing, essentially. As this story unfolded, there was a storm that came up on the third day, and it swept out of the sound to places as far distant as 1,500 miles away from the point of impact, oiling about 3,200 miles of coastline in between all the bays and the nooks and the coves. I mean, one day it was in the middle of Prince William Sound, you know, just sort of waiting. And literally the next morning, it was smeared across all of Southwest Sound and beyond.
When the oil was released into Prince William Sound, such a massive quantity, people observed the entire ecosystem to be falling apart. Uh, dying birds, uh, dying fish, the sea otters, seals, the orcas, the, uh, all of the wildlife was uh, being destroyed right in front of it. If you go out into some of the areas where the oil hit the beaches the hardest, there's no more wildlife. You can go out there and spend hours and, and the birds aren't there, the seals aren't there. There's a quietness that never was before. Unless you ever been here and seen it, you could not understand it. But after that oil spill hit, it's quiet. I don't think you can clean it all up. I don't know that they even ever intended to clean it all up. And from the time they let it get away from them until now, I haven't seen them do anything. And when you look at this, you know damn good and well, there's too much, there's, there's just too much coastline, too many rocks, too many inaccessible areas. I don't know how they'll do it. Well, we've all been through the same thing. We're almost, you know, kind of like a band of brothers, as it were. If people weren't here, they really don't have a complete understanding of what it was like. I used to wonder when I was younger, for example, why my grandparents couldn't get over the Great Depression or why my uncles couldn't get over World War II. And what I know now is big events like that, you don't get over. They become just a part of you and a part of the other people who are around you at the same time. Everything that the industry and government told us, that they could handle an oil spill of this magnitude, that they could clean one up, uh, that it would only happen once in every 432 years, it happened in the 13th year of operation. And that oil spill set off a chain of events that basically changed our entire way of life as we know it here in the ocean. There's still oil out there. They estimate somewhere between 150 and 200 tons. And you can scratch down in many beaches that have been cleaned, some of them several times, and there's oil below the surface that's just probably as toxic now as it was the day it was spilled, except it's kind of hidden from view. You don't see it anymore. In 1989, I had a number of people tell me, well, I'm not worried about today. I'm worried about the next 25 years. I'm worried about the long-term health of Prince William Sound. At the time of the oil spill in 89, fishermen, for example, were told, they went to scientists and said, what, what should we do? This is where we fish, this is where we get our living. Is Prince William Sound ruined forever? Should we sell out? And the scientists said, well, no, we don't think so. We think there's only going to be short-term damage. This literally was the thinking based on the old 1970s science. So the scientists told the fishermen, we think it'll be all right. Fishermen stayed. When the spill happened, the fisheries were shut down because the oil in the water and everything made it impossible. The concern was that the fish get oiled and they would get into the marketplace and cause a really major disruption. The city of Cordova and the two villages in the Sound are totally dependent upon commercial and subsistence fishing for our existence. On April 3, 1989, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game announced that our herring fishing days were over. The impact of the spill on the salmon fishery is uncertain. We also greatly fear the socioeconomic displacements that will afflict our community as a result of this tragedy. The herring fisheries were a huge source of this town's income. The bays used to just turn black with herring, and now there's, there's none. So it just wiped out the entire biomass of herring. I mean, you, you have to have a seed to start something, and herring hasn't recovered at all. As soon as that oil spewed into the water, our prices just plummeted. It went from a dollar a pound down to a nickel a pound at one point. When you add up all the fishermen and the processors and the dollars that we make for the herring fishery, would be worth 75 to 100 million dollars to us every single year. Wiped out the herring. 
We haven't fished a herring, but probably two or three out of the last 16 years. Well, what does that do to your economy? What does that do to the people? The initial years after the spill was, it was a very sad place. You get into a discussion about the impact and people, would, tears would come to their eyes and they'd choke up. And the general attitude was, uh, this is never gonna be the same place again. This is a daily thing that we're living with here. This kind of looming shadow of the oil spill's impact. You know, it's hard to explain, but it's not just a financial hit. These fishermen carry a sadness and an anger that was never acknowledged in 1989. You spent a lot of money to gear up to get ready to go fish. And uh, we had a situation after the spill then where the price was absolutely bottomed out. And that really killed, you know, a bunch of guys. And we have less than half the boats fishing now. And, you know, you go out to the marina, they've been sitting out there for years, and I hadn't realized it. But they'd all finally, everybody just sold them off. They'd been bought, they're gone to other fisheries, and they weren't there. The fallout in, in the villages, in the communities, was really horrific to witness. There were divorces. Uh, a lot of alcohol and drug abuse. A lot of people, you know, just didn't know how to cope. Prince William Sound was the heart of the culture and the identity of many of its people. And the fact that that place has not recovered and may not recover for centuries to come is devastating to their spirit. That's actually something Exxon can't make whole. Believe it or not, there was a lot of camaraderie you know, within this community uh, in the time of hardship or even, you know, in the time of loss. But it was too much to overcome from the Exxon Valdez oil spill. And this community has yet to recover. Our former mayor, he was mayor during the Exxon Valdez oil spill, Bob Van Brocklin, uh, committed suicide. There was a lot of stress during that period of time, and I'm sure that was uh, definitely part of the problem. Bobby Van Brocklin was uh, an individual who had uh, generational ties uh, in, in Cordova. And he was very much a point person in the early years following the spill. He was going to be our expert witness on how much we've lost as fishermen, as a fishing community, economically. He was running up a huge debt. His businesses in town were, were going bankrupt. And it, it just finally overwhelmed him. The level of stress and the anguish, just the hopelessness. You know, a lot of people don't know what to do or how to make things right. Coupled with the financial burdens of not being able to have the incomes that we would normally have, you know, I told some of my friends and my family is we need to start spending you know, more time out in the Copper River or out in places that are still sacred and still pristine and enjoy those places. We had to let go a lot of this fear and this pain that was caused from the Exxon Valdez oil spill because I didn't want to see it destroy the very fabric of what kept everybody sane and together. After the spill happened and after people realized that their livelihoods were gonna be destroyed, the fishermen were forced to go to court because Exxon wasn't willing to make them whole without being taken to court. The fishermen went to court, and the court said to Exxon, well, you ruined these people's livelihoods. You have to make them whole. That's your responsibility. We had a trial, lasted about four months in 1994, and in September the jury came back and they awarded the plaintiffs five billion of punitive damages because they felt Exxon's conduct was outrageous and reprehensible. After the jury made its award, Exxon appealed. And then they appealed again. And then the case went back to the lower level. And again, an award was made. And again, Exxon appealed. And again, they appealed. And now they're appealing again. They have dragged this on through the legal system for as long as very skillful and very well-paid lawyers can possibly arrange to do. 
Now, here we are, 16 years later, and Exxon has not paid a penny of the $5 billion in punitive damages. Five billion was about one year of net earnings for Exxon at that time. Now it's Exxon Mobil, and their growth has been phenomenal. And we're still sitting here hoping that we will get this case resolved. It appears to me that they are succeeding just through their power to not do anything. Exxon made a heck of a lot of money in 1989. Um, within weeks, they recovered. Um, we haven't recovered. You know, if, uh, if it weren't Exxon, if it were a fisherman, for example, who committed the lesser environmental crime of, say, shooting a stellar sea lion, they wouldn't be fined a certain modest percentage of their yearly profits. Their vessel would be seized. Their permit would be taken from them. Exxon will never be effectively punished, no matter what the monetary award can ever be. It's a clear-cut case. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Some people would say it would be a legal slam dunk. Actually, what's happened is turned into a legal nightmare. Most of us have been fortunate. We've never been personally involved in a long lawsuit. It is debilitating. You think about it all the time. It just messes with your life in ways that are very difficult to describe. And to put an entire community of innocent people through 16 years of high intensity, vicious litigation is just inhuman. Whatever repercussions this brings to anybody, to native and non-native alike, we lost a lot. Our people lost a lot and our lawyers came back every couple years yeah it's gonna be next summer it's gonna be next fall it's gonna be a year and a half from now two and a half years ago they told us it's gonna be probably next spring and they've been telling us for 16 years this story and all of our friends have died bankrupt and <clears throat> they're out of fishing Myself, I'm, you know, I lost it all. Our way of life has drastically changed where Exxon's way of life has profited. Their settlement to us is a speed bump. They're just stalling because they don't want to have any precedent set that if something like this ever happens again, which it will, that they have to pay any more than they have to. The outcome of this story should be that Exxon should pay its bills. When you and I get a bill, if we hurt somebody, somebody much littler than we are, and we know that we owe them money, we don't spend years appealing it. We pay what we owe, and Exxon ought to pay what it owes. It is hard to stand up to giants, but somebody has to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, if I could speak to the board of directors and the CEO of Exxon, first thing I would say is that there should be in your corporate culture uh, the ability to empathetically understand the consequences of your illegal behavior and get on with the consequences that this oil spill had. Pay the people what you owe them and, uh, and then let them move on. But. I guess uh, uh, that's uh, too simple and too humanitarian an act. We're hoping that Exxon will just do for us is just settle up with us and make it right so we can get on with our life and they can get on with theirs. We felt that we were the ones left holding the bag. We're left alone to defend ourselves and figure out how we're going to make it on our own. You know, I, I just feel on, on a personal level that I'm, I'm ashamed of Exxon. I feel betrayed by them, and a lot of people have died that will never see compensation, and Exxon should make it right as soon as they possibly can. The legacy of the Exxon Valdez oil spill, in my mind, uh, is yet to be written. I mean, whether or not this court case finally gets resolved, uh, 
ultimately the legacy will be whether we get justice or not. Right now, we have no legacy. The net legacy is very negative for most people. In Alaska, 85% of our general operating money comes from the North Slope oil industry. So this is a pretty oily state. I mean, 85 cents of every dollar comes from the oil companies. Uh, I'd like to see that change. In the future, it's going to have to change. We need to get off of oil. We need to look at alternative energy and natural energy. Nobody's figured out how to stop the sun from coming out every day. Nobody's figured out how to stop the wind from blowing. And nobody's figured out how to stop the tides from turning. So as long as we could harness those energies, we could replace all of the energy that is being created from fossil fuels. It's not like it's not possible. The technology exists, the wisdom exists, but it takes a huge amount of courage and a lot of heart to do the right thing. This community has learned a lot from the spill. They've overcome a lot. The spill has, has really cost this community, but at the same time, they have coped and demonstrated their resilience. Cordova has been here since 1907. Uh, and it will always be here. Kind of the general feeling in this town is that when this lawsuit is finally over, we will be able to lay this thing to rest. And the other thing we're looking at as an indicator that the sound has recovered is we're looking for the herring to recover. Pretty much we say when the herring have recovered, then we as a community will have recovered. You know, if I could talk to Exxon face to face or the courts, made a mess, clean it up, I mean, that's how people live, you know? It's a responsible thing to do, that's what you do. You, you know, spill something in someone else's house, you clean it up. And they spilled something in our home, and they never were held responsible for it. The people of Cordova have found hope in the face of catastrophe and corporate apathy. For the latest information on their Exxon case and clean energy alternatives that could halt further oil development in Alaska, please visit us at sierraclubtv.org. Funding provided by the Ford Foundation, with additional support from the Sierra Club Foundation.